It's December 1965. Residents of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, have just heard that a strange object has landed in the woods outside of town. So they are heading to the crash site. They make their way carefully into the woods and are soon drawn to a glowing light emanating from the object. Up close, it looks like a bronze-colored bell. They see inscriptions on the object that look like hieroglyphics. A few hours later, the army seals off the woods, claiming that it is a matter of national security. Where did the object come from? Could it be an alien spacecraft? circles some stories have stirred such a craze that they have become part of the popular culture such is the case for the story of the flying saucer that crashed near Roswell New Mexico if it had not been for the crash this town of 50,000 would never have become so well known tourists come from all over to visit flying saucer central every July the town celebrates the anniversary of what some people consider to be the event of the century In early July 1947, a local rancher, Mac Brazo, discovered a lot of strange debris on his property, varying from ultralight aluminum paper to small pieces of what looked like balsam wood. A few days later, he told the town sheriff, George Wilcox, who advised the military base outside of Roswell, headquarters of the 509th Bomb Squadron, the only unit in the world with an atom bomb. That same day, Major Jesse Marcel and Captain Sheridan Cavett showed up to recover the debris. A few hours later, Colonel Blanchard, commander of the Roswell base, issued a press release stating that they had captured a flying saucer. But once the debris had been shipped off to the military base in Fort Worth, Texas, authorities retracted that statement. General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, stated that the debris found in Roswell was nothing more than the remnants of a weather balloon. The Roswell case was closed, at least for now. Well, according to the story, something fell to the ground near Roswell in July 1947. Roswell was the only American nuclear base at the time, and it was believed that the object was a flying saucer. The news was announced by the media following a press release issued by the military base. Then the whole thing was later denied by the U.S. Army. They claimed that an error had been made. The object was nothing more than a weather balloon, not one of those flying saucers that the media had been talking about for two weeks following a sighting by Kenneth Arnold. The story died down until the end of the 1970s, when one of the key witnesses came forward, a Major Jesse Marcel, who had been to the Brazel ranch to recover the wreckage from the flying saucer. He said, that the whole story was true, that they really had recovered an alien spaceship in Roswell, and that the U.S. Army had been covering up the truth for 30 years. After that, other witnesses came forward, who were more or less credible. The story became known nationally, then internationally. And now, it has become somewhat of a myth. Now, it's hard to tell what's fact and what's fiction, since so many false statements have been added to the mix.
the statements made years later describe a whole different story than what was originally told to the press. According to the new version, two flying saucers crashed in the Roswell Desert in 1947. One exploded in the sky over the Brazel Ranch, where all the debris was found. Then the second one landed in the plains of St. Augustine. Or perhaps it was the same object that was damaged while over the Brazel Ranch, then rose again to continue on its westward path. At this second crash site, authorities supposedly recovered a spaceship that was nearly intact, as well as four to six humanoid bodies. There seemed to be two parts to the Roswell story. On one hand, there were statements made about the debris found at the Brazel Ranch, primarily made by first-hand witnesses and at times confirmed in official documents. For instance, Major Jesse Marcel gave an interview in the late 1970s, saying that the remnants could not be torn or burned. If crumpled in a ball, they would spring back to their original shape, like mylar. Marcel also explained that before being shown to the press, the real debris was replaced by remnants of a weather balloon. On the other hand, there were statements made about recovering a spaceship and its occupants. Those were basically second and third hand accounts. The most famous crash retrieval incident is the Roswell incident of 1948, 1947, I'm sorry, and that happened just a few weeks after the Kenneth Arnold sighting, which kind of christened flying saucers as a special phenomenon. Broadly speaking, what happened, what certainly happened, is that an object, probably a disc-shaped object, crashed in the deserts in New Mexico, and uh, in fact quite near the um, uh, high highly um, secret work that was going on developing the at atomic bomb and developing the, you know, the Almagordo projects and so on, White Sands, all in that area. And certainly uh, a military unit was sent out to retrieve that, that disc and that military unit came from at that time the only atomic bomb wing in the world, the 509th bomb wing. Now when they retrieved it and brought it back, there was a big splash in the papers because a higher uh, official there actually released the information that a, a disc had been recovered and then they were forced to retract that and say that it wasn't anything so on. Now that certainly happened, but that is not the same as saying flying saucers with a lot of little aliens. What then happened was that there was certainly a lot of mischief going on in, uh, and we do know that it was quite frequent with these sort of emerging radio and TV stations in America. They sought out hoax stories about discs with little bodies and all the rest of it. That was certainly a hoax. Whether Roswell had real little aliens recovered or whether it was mixed up with the hoax is really difficult to determine now. But when we when we look at the history of the way it came out, Roswell was actually not particularly, no one was interested in Roswell, right from 1947 virtually to 1973 when Stanton Friedman started to actually bring out a lot of information about this. And he kind of put the stories together, made a pretty coherent package which was very interesting, but which may have picked up some of the silly stories along with some of the real stories. So there's a certain amount we do know, certain amount that's speculated, certain amount I feel is pretty doubtful that has been led on in the past few years, we've become very conspiracy theorist and very exaggerated in our fears and so on. So I think Roswell is probably not all people would like it to be, but it's certainly one of the real crash retrievals of, some, of something anyway in, in history. I would say that there are two stories related to Roswell. One is associated with the first alleged crash site visited by Jesse Marcel where they found strange material with properties that were extraordinary for that time period, such as aluminum paper that could not be torn, which would return to its original state after being crumpled in a ball. There were several witnesses, including Mark Brazel, the rancher who found the debris, Jesse Marcel, who recovered the debris, his wife and son, to whom he showed the wreckage before going to the base, as well as the people at the base and the sheriff of Roswell. Then there's the second story, which might be true, but which is only supported by second-hand accounts or unreliable witnesses. According to this story, there was an initial crash, and then, after hitting the ground once, the spaceship allegedly flew further and crashed again. And that's where they found the bodies in the ship. That's when the Roswell cover-up began.
according to witnesses. The Roswell crash of 1947, something that perhaps the official public world may never truly know. Uh, it is my suspicion that something not of America's technology crashed, not Soviet. Um, you could do the math. I think that it would be something that we might call extraterrestrial, that crash at Roswell. Crash or landed, whatever, something that the American military recovered. I do believe that that is the least crazy scenario. The Mogul explanation is weak, uh, threadbare, and really nothing, nothing to hang your hat on. The, there is, on the other hand, a great deal of testimony from witnesses, not all of whom are crazy, not all of whom are fabricators, in my view who um, describe things about that that make me think it was extraterrestrial. For example, the testimony of General Arthur Exxon. Exxon at the time was an officer at Wright Airfield in Ohio. Exxon did not ever see wreckage, did not ever see dead bodies. But Exxon, uh, who later became the commander of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, did say that immediately after the Roswell event, he heard rumors at Wright Airfield of alien bodies and heard uh, reports from people who analyzed the material which went to Wright Pat, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, that described it as extraordinary. I mean, in other words, why would a mogul balloon be tested at Wright Patterson Air Force Base? Why? Why would they be testing this material? It makes no sense. Uh, the reason I think that an alien craft did crash at Roswell is because I think that there, there's sufficient evidence for the rest of the UFO phenomenon both before and after 1947. In 1994, wanting to know more about the Roswell crash, New Mexico Republican Stephen Schiff went to see the Air Force, who politely told him that he should check with the National Archives Office. At the National Archives, he was told that he should speak to the Air Force for information about Roswell. Tired of being treated like a ping-pong ball, Schiff went to the General Accounting Office, a sort of ombudsman for U.S. politicians, who instructed the Air Force to allow Schiff access to its archives. In July 1995, the GAO published its investigation report. Other than stating that several documents had been lost or destroyed, the report mentioned that certain documents had been found relating to secret projects that might shed light on the Roswell mystery. When the Air Force had to reopen its files, I don't think they really knew what they would find. Because it had been so long that no one really remembered anymore. They dug into the files and discovered what UFO researchers already knew. Something had indeed landed in Roswell. It wasn't just a tale or a rumor. The question was, what exactly was it that fell? At the time of the incident, the world was still in the Cold War period. And the state's number one enemy was not the Martians, it was the Russians. The military was using every means possible to keep track of what the Russians were doing, especially with respect to the atomic bomb. The U.S. was leading the arms race at the time, but not for long. One of the projects designed for this purpose was the launching of sensors into the upper atmosphere to detect possible atomic bomb explosions by the Russians. The Roswell incident was supposedly linked to this project. In my opinion, a project like this would be the most likely explanation for the object that landed in Roswell. They were launching trains of balloons, several weather balloons tied together hundreds of feet long with measuring instruments attached at the end. It was a top-secret operation. The balloons were launched into the upper atmosphere where the instruments would take their readings. Then the balloons would fall into the desert. It seems that what the rancher found on his property was nothing more than remnants of a train of balloons. He thought it was wreckage from a spaceship, but he hadn't actually seen a spaceship, just pieces of metal and assorted junk, which he brought back to the Roswell base. The Roswell base was not aware of the balloon train program being carried out by the Alamo Gordo base. When they saw the debris, they used the word flying disc, since it was a buzzword at the time, and the story took off from there. 
While the GAO was preparing its report, the Air Force decided to publish its own. The Roswell Report was a thousand-page document in which flying saucers came from a strange planet named Mogul. The first report um, explained the Roswell crash as the probable wreckage of a uh, type of classified balloon known as Mogul, uh, which was a real project, which was designed to determine when the Soviet Union uh, would detonate its own nuclear device. This was uh, 1947 and 48. Mogul was a highly classified project. There were Mogul balloon tests in that area, and there were crashes of Mogul balloons. Uh, the Air Force uh, released its report in 1995 that stated this thesis. The Air the Air Force took the lead, publishing its first report in 1994 or 1995, admitting that they had not told the truth originally. It had not been a weather balloon. It had been a large balloon train, referred to as mogul balloons, which were top secret at the time, used to detect Russian atomic explosions. They had not worked very well, but they were highly secret at the time. And that's why the army had lied to the press, to hide the truth. When the military investigated in 1995, Captain McAndrew, one of the authors of the report, discovered a program for spying on the Russians. At the time, the program was top secret. But in 1995, there was no longer any reason to keep it secret. When the Roswell incident resurfaced in the 1980s, they had forgotten about it and didn't see any reason to go digging into their archives. I think that people give the government too much credit, whether it be in the US, France, Canada or some other country, when they think that the government knows everything. They don't remember what they did 30 years ago. They had to go digging, and what they found is what appears in the thousand-page report. The report itself isn't that long. The rest is just appendices and files from that time period that they republished. Practically two-thirds of this huge report is nothing more than technical data on the Mogul project. The report gets into the nuts and bolts, everything you could possibly want to know. After reading that report, you could practically write a thesis on the subject. This report makes us wonder how the country's top military experts working at the base at the time could have acted like General Jack Ripper from the movie Dr. Strangelove. They would have had about as much credibility if we are to believe the report released by the U.S. Air Force. The report describes its military as untrustworthy individuals, incapable of recognizing mundane technology that any farmer would know to be man-made and not alien in nature. If we look at the diagrams and photos of the Mogul project, all we see is ordinary material. The mission itself was secret, but the technology dated back to 1947, and there was nothing special about it. So the report really makes its information officers look incompetent. Then in 1997, with uncharacteristic concern, the U.S. Air Force released a second report called Roswell, Case Closed. This report made it clear that the Army wanted to put an end to rumors of a spaceship found with bodies in it, a subject that had been overlooked in the 1995 report. And in 1997, uh, because the Air Force hadn't dealt with rumors of alien bodies recovered and so on, issued another report that tried to explain that. And they said that, well, the uh, body stories are probably uh, the result of uh, the testing of uh, uh, parachute airdrop testing, in which we would drop these uh, human-sized dummies in the ground to test uh, you know, uh, airdropping. Uh, now, those tests occurred in the 1950s. They did not occur in the 1940s. Nevertheless, uh, this was the Air Force explanation. Since questions were still being asked about alien bodies being discovered, which the Army had denied, they decided to explain it in the second report, 
They ended up explaining the second crash. After having passed off the first crash as nothing more than mogul balloons, they brushed off the second one saying, well, those people, the witnesses, uh, perhaps they were mistaken. And those witnesses all seem to have Alzheimer's and cannot recall the exact time of the incidents. They seem to have mixed up things that happened in the test areas around Roswell, New Mexico between 1947 and 1964. They mentioned ground testing of NASA probes that could have been mistaken for a flying saucer. It was the same for the crash test dummies. They mixed up several things that took place in the 1940s and 1950s. There were people who served as test subjects to examine the effects of plane and balloon crashes, victims of real accidents, as seen by the photo of a pilot with a bandaged head. According to the report, that's why people were so confused at the time. They were mixed up, and they invented this story of the second crash based on elements that were scattered in time and space. As far as the Air Force was concerned, the Roswell saga had nothing to do with visitors from outer space. The alleged crash and recovery of alien bodies was nothing more than a series of military activities carried out in the Roswell Desert between 1947 and 1965. An explanation that many people find difficult to believe. I've read the United States Air Force, uh, the, the two United States Air Force reports on the Roswell incident. I think uh, oh, one of them entitled Roswell Case Closed. Um, and I, I have to say it, it, it looks pretty convincing. They've clearly made efforts to uh, find as much information as possible uh, about this um, and and I think they've done their best to put into the public domain uh, the position as they see it and where information is missing I don't see that there's necessarily anything suspicious about that because that's the way that that governments and large bureaucracies uh, work. Sometimes I lose a paper that I wrote last week. So I, I don't blame anyone uh, if documents that are now over 50 years old uh, are missing. I think it was perhaps unfortunate that there was this attempt to link uh, uh, the, the Roswell incident with the, uh, the, the crash test dummy tests. Uh, because those, to me, the times were not even the same and it seemed slightly irrelevant to bring that in. Um, but, you, you know, perhaps they were just trying to address, to the best of their ability, the allegations about uh, humanoid bodies. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that part was possibly uh, not directly relevant. Sur la question. As for the mogul balloons, I think it's pretty easy to come up with objections to that theory. First of all, it doesn't seem very likely that the commander of a military base with the atom bomb would have mistaken a mogul balloon for a flying saucer and issued a press release stating that we have captured a flying disc. A mogul balloon train consisted of 20 to 25 balloons attached to a cable. The fact remains that they were balloons. And if I do say so myself, you'd have to be pretty daft to mistake those balloons for a flying saucer. And these men were the Army's best. Secondly, there is still something strange that has never been properly explained. Having made this error, why would they go and announce it to the press, to the entire world? That seems odd. If it's true that Colonel Blanchard issued the release of his own accord, then he should have been severely disciplined. On the contrary, he led a very successful career achieving the rank of a four-star general. I have a problem with that. I also have a problem with one of the two people who visited the site of the debris. We know that Commander Marcel explained that the debris was extraordinary in nature, but his opinion was disputed. 
He was accompanied by Captain Sheridan Cavett, who worked with counter-espionage. Cavett was interrogated by the Air Force. There is even a 30-page description of the interrogation in the Air Force's huge report. They tried to convince him to say that he had seen a mogul balloon, but he absolutely refused. He would not admit that this was what he had seen. He stuck to the story that he had seen a weather balloon with its radar target. That's another strange thing that doesn't make sense. Because if he didn't remember for sure, he should have gone along with them and said, uh, yes, you're right, that must have been what I saw, a mogul balloon. The fact that he refused to say it is very interesting. Here we have two witnesses who were at the scene, and neither of which admitted to having seen the mogul balloon that they had supposedly discovered. The reports about Ros will indicate, I mean, they were basically saying that, Ros, that what was recovered was was not an, an alien in a flying saucer. I don't think anyone was shocked that the, I mean, the government weren't going to say anything else. If they had concluded that, they were either going to say they were either going to lie or keep very quiet. They said what one would expect them to say. I actually don't, personally, I don't think Roswell was the crash of an alien flying saucer. Indeed, I'm not, I, I'm fairly well on record as saying I'm not absolutely sure that's the explanation to UFOs. And I would like to stress, I do believe UFOs are a real thing, but it don't have to have that explanation. So I'm not worried about the idea that Roswell was not aliens, etc. And I think the government may well have been telling the truth on that degree. What's important about those reports in 1995, the government released in 1997, also earlier reports, is that they also contained lies. And we know the government lies about UFOs. I think it lies legitimately, one might say, because it doesn't want to give out information about its intelligence gathering um, sources and so on, that's, that's I think fair enough. I think it also lies because it's afraid of what the population can do in panic and it feels that the population will panic on certain information. And uh, you know they, they quote Orson Welles when he released the story of the door of the worlds and everyone panicked in, in New York and so on, all that sort of thing. And, and I think that governs a lot of the government's actions. Going back from those reports and Roswell right back to the CIA in 1951, they'd made a very in, in, a telling comment that they were interested in communication studies of UFOs. And I don't think they meant the communications of flying saucers. I think they meant the way the population deals with these stories and so on. And I think that's been a real governing theme of the governments, in a, particularly American government, over 40 or 50 years, is that they want not exactly to control the population, but to know that the population population is not going to get out of control. So I think that report, which came actually without so much pressure, it wasn't actually pressured to come out, I think it was released partly as a way of kind of population, taking the steam off the population and so on. The validity of that Air Force explanation, in my view, I, I view it as very weak. Uh, the, uh, it, it's really only possible to argue the Air Force case, frankly, uh, if you ignore essentially the testimony of everyone who claims to have had any knowledge of Roswell uh, is a, a very highly selective document in terms of the evidence that it uses to make its case. And it's surprisingly weak when you look at the actual evidence that the Air Force puts forth. Uh, that evidence being that the photograph of the uh, supposed Roswell wreckage that was in the Roswell Daily uh, Messenger, uh, Roswell News of 1947 looks like a mogul balloon might have looked. Of course, that doesn't deal with the accusation of Jesse Marcel that that material wasn't the material he uncovered. Um, the Mogul explanation really rests only on that. Um, the rest of the Mogul explanation deals with when the uh, balloon launch might have taken place. Um, so that uh, it's a very thin read to rest such an argument on. My feeling is that the Air Force felt a need to deal with this issue because Roswell by 1995 had become a very significant public relations problem, uh, something that had to be dealt with in some way. Uh, and the same thing with the 1997 report. Although UFO groups accuse the Army of being less than thorough in finding pro-Roswell witnesses, the opposite is also true. In reading the literature that abounds on the subject, it's amazing to see the questionable witness reports that seem to have been accepted as credible by UFO researchers.
Let's take Glenn Dennis, for example. In 1947, Dennis was working as an assistant at the Ballard Funeral Home in Roswell. Early in July, he allegedly received a phone call from the military asking whether he had any small body bags, like the ones used to carry children, to which he replied that he did not. Later that afternoon, he supposedly went to the Roswell military base and saw a strange flying machine mounted on a flatbed truck. Then, the next day, Dennis ran into a nurse from the base who said that she had assisted in performing an autopsy of an alien the night before. Everything about this account rings false. If the Army had genuinely found alien bodies, they would never have contacted the assistant of the Roswell Funeral Home to inquire about body bags. It would never have allowed a civilian to enter the base while it was carrying out the most extraordinary recovery operation of all time. And it certainly wouldn't have left a flatbed truck loaded with an alien craft out in the open for all eyes to see. As for the story about the nurse, it seemed to change each time that Dennis told it. She may have died from cancer or a plane accident, or she may have died in her sleep on a military base in England. Despite all the unlikelihoods in his story, all books written about Roswell seem to focus on Glenn Dennis's testimony. And this is just one of dozens of others that are just as questionable. This one only goes to show that it's easier for UFO researchers to find fault with the Army rather than looking in their own backyard. As for the physical proof of the Roswell crash, everything from the film of the alien autopsy to the so-called flying saucer remnants were shown to be a hoax. The Roswell crash has become so well known that people sometimes tend to think that it's the only one of its kind, which is not true. Other similar incidents have occurred since 1947. For example, in his book, Behind the Flying Saucers, published in 1950, Frank Scully discusses a rumor of a strange craft and its occupants that crashed near Aztec, New Mexico. We now know that Scully's sources were con artists, but that doesn't seem to matter. The Aztec incident is still part of UFO folklore. Mixed up with the Roswell crash is also the report of a crash in Aztec, New Mexico, and an another saucer is alleged to have come down. Now, there are, there are three real possibilities about that, or at least three obvious possibilities that one could list. One is that it was another saucer that crashed, and if we concede that flying saucers are flying over Mexico, and if they can be damaged in that way, then if there were several on a surveillance, then they could come down in two places. That's possible. The second possibility is that it was in fact the same flying saucer and that the second piece of debris is actually part of the damage of the first one which mostly disintegrated over New Mexico and part of it may have wobbled on and crashed in, in, in Aztec. The third possibility, and I think frankly it's the strongest one, uh, we know that the Roswell crash was a real crash of something real, whatever it may be. Uh, I should say the listening disc is, is the favoured possibility, an actual disc, huge disc shaped thing, which in 1947 was used to be carried high into the high atmosphere, which could sort of listen round corners in the days before, it was ten years before we put the first satellite in orbit, so it, it's possible it was that kind of dish. But assuming that, that that was the real thing at Roswell, there was certainly a lot of mischief about Aztec with local newspaper reports, local, particularly local radio stations. Aztec was certainly one of the hoax ones as well. So whether it, the hoaxes were built on an actual story of a crash, or whether the, the whole crash story was virtually a hoax, is now you know, 50 years on, very difficult to determine. And, and there are proponents of both beliefs, in, particularly in America, where they've got certain witnesses, they claim have claimed them, but they're usually the, the sons or daughters of the witnesses who are no longer alive and so on, and certain people are pretty convinced it's a hoax. I think the water is so muddy at Roswell and, and Aztec that we may actually never really know the truth, frankly. On December 9th, 1965, a strange object landed in the woods near Kecksburg, a small town 120 miles from Pittsburgh. After the crash, a handful of volunteers, including firemen, went to the woods to investigate. They found a bell-shaped object about the size of a compact car. The Army soon arrived on the scene and told all witnesses to keep quiet about what they had seen. Under the cover of night, the spacecraft was moved to a secret location. Just like Roswell, 
There's no doubt that something landed in Kecksburg. While a handful of residents swear that it was an alien spacecraft, the Army claims that it was nothing more than a meteorite. In that case, it wasn't just a matter of hearsay. There were actual eyewitnesses, including firemen. The situation was like Roswell. There were several witnesses who seemed to be reliable, telling this story about the object landing in Kecksburg, and their story seemed to be plausible. Something unusual fell from the sky, was recovered, and then disappeared from sight. It could have been a Soviet space object, or who knows? According to the descriptions given, if it was of Soviet origin, it certainly wasn't a conventional object. The fact remains that apparently something real was recovered. UFO crashes don't just happen in the United States. On October 4, 1967, the crew of an Air Canada DC-8 saw a group of bright objects flying near 12,000 feet altitude. Suddenly, two explosions broke up the strange group. One of the objects left the formation and headed off in the direction of Nova Scotia. With co-author Don Ledger, I've written a book titled Dark Object. And uh, it's a mass market paperback that tells the story of a UFO crash that occurred off the coast, southern western tip of Nova Scotia in 1967. It was the night of October 4th, which was a Wednesday. It was a moonless night. The sky was clear. And uh, what happened was the local residents seen a set of lights that were at least 60 feet in one dimension. They were evenly spaced 15 feet apart. They flashed in sequence. They hovered for at least five minutes over the harbor after entering from an easterly direction over the Gulf of Maine. They tilted to a 45 degree angle and descended rapidly to the water's surface, striking it, producing a bright flash and the sound of an explosion. Several local residents called the nearby RCMP detachment. It's interesting to note here that unlike many cases, no one reported a UFO. They simply said that lights or perhaps an aircraft that crashed in the water. Concerns were for survivors. The RCMP dispatched three officers in two separate vehicles to the scene. And when they got to the shoreline, they saw a pale yellow light moving over the water, and it was at least eight feet off the surface. They looked at it through field glasses, and eventually it moved around to the point where it left a trail that was 80 feet by half a mile long, and this was dense yellow foam that smelled of sulfur, had a sparkle to it. They grabbed two local fishing boats and attempted to reach the impact site, but before they could get to it, the object either submerged or disappeared. There were bubbles at the surface and a strong sulfur smell in the air where the object hit the water. If it was an aircraft, the rescuers would have to act quickly if they wanted to save the survivors. Rescue boats headed south, but they didn't find any wreckage or survivors. The Royal Canadian Mounting Police was, of course, the, by the nature of their work, the people who were first to respond to this. But upon the scene, and when they coordinated with the Rescue Coordination Center and two nearby military bases, Canadian Forces Station Shelburne and CFS Barrington at Backrow, it was clear that it wasn't an aircraft. Of course, their, of course, their own observations told them that. They contacted higher headquarters in Ottawa, and it was determined at defense headquarters that an extensive underwater search would be carried out, which involved the Coast Guard and naval divers of HMCS Granby. This search continued until Monday. It occurred Wednesday night. At that time, the search was terminated, and they claimed no results. They never denied the belief that a UFO had gone in the water, and they clearly called it that. They simply said that they had found nothing. Now, what is interesting, however, is that local residents, and some documentation, does keep the door open. Some people claim artifacts were recovered. And the thing is, we do have a document that says quite clearly who would have received those documents. It was a civilian scientific consultant to DND. But again, the official response is nil results. The incident was forgotten until the early 1990s when UFO researcher Chris Stiles began searching for official documents written by authorities at the time of the incident. 
His research soon drew the attention of the producers of Sightings, an American TV series about strange and unexplained phenomena. In 1995, Paramount Television's syndicated show Sightings funded an underwater search, and what it was, was I proposed to them doing a four-day survey, which would include side-scan sonar, a sub-bottom profiler, magnetometer, and divers, to go over the initial impact site of the naval search. The Canadian Navy and the Coast Guard and RCMP divers searched that area for some time. They had a firm belief that something had gone into the water. Checking with the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, they knew it was clear that there was no missing aircraft. They didn't suspect a meteorite right or natural cause. The thing was, at that time in 67, the search for the craft responsible for the crash was a low-tech affair. It would have been pairs of divers going over the side with flashlights. The water visibility was only 20 feet. With today's technology, it was relatively simple and cheap to look. I thought it was a long shot that we would find any evidence, but one had to look if it could have been lying down there all that time. And so we did. We had our four-day search with those things. And to be honest, we found absolutely nothing unusual. But I'm not discouraged by that because that actually tells us something. Because in a case where there was so much corroboration and the actions of the military and the documentation, which is a, an extensive paper trail, says clearly they were certain that this was a UFO and that it was lost there. You have to ask, where did this 60-foot object go? This is shallow water. With this technology, there's not a trace. There's no trauma, no evidence whatsoever. So it's like the one that got away. It remains a great mystery. Although Shag Harbor remains a mystery, other stories of UFO crashes seem to be hoaxes made up by money mongers. In the summer of 1989, UFO researchers heard of a crash in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, near the Botswana border. According to a report supposedly written by the South African Air Force, on May 7, 1989, the military had shot down an unidentified flying object with an experimental laser gun. They then captured two humanoid occupants, who put up a fight, but were eventually taken to an Air Force base in Pretoria. Then, for some odd reason, the humanoids were flown to the United States. Their last known destination was the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. One of the crash retrievals around the world that didn't happen in America, which is crash retrieval central for most of the UFO phenomena, happened in South Africa, uh, uh, the, um, a crash in the Kalahari Desert there. I've not investigated it personally, but I do have a great deal of faith in, in a researcher in Africa called Cynthia, Cynthia, Cynthia Hind, unfortunately, who's now uh, died recently, um, and she investigated it firsthand, and it was her conclusion that it was probably a hoax. Her view was that actually someone was deliberately manufacturing evidence to make a book, sell a story, get a TV series, or whatever else. And I can't comment on that because I, I wasn't there and I haven't seen the evidence firsthand and I haven't personally spoken to anybody. But I have a great deal of respect for Cynthia Hines. She, she was a, a very strong proponent of UFOs. She believed they were aliens. She believed that they came from other planets and so on, which is not particularly my belief. And against that background, she was not impressed with that evidence. And, and, and I think that, that, to me, gave me a lot of doubts about that case. Um, beyond that, I don't have any direct information on that one. One of the suspicious elements raised by Cynthia Hyde was the fact that the so-called official report was written in English rather than in Afrikaans, the official language of Pretoria. She also found it odd that the report was full of spelling errors and that it mentioned the title squadron leader, which did not exist in the South African Army. It only existed in the British Royal Air Force. There was also the fact that the document was released to the public by James Van Gronen, a known con artist. Books are filled with stories of UFO crashes, and they all have one thing in common, a lack of physical proof. If alien spaceships have really crashed on our planet, where are they? Could they be stored in a huge crate, in a warehouse, among thousands of other crates? A possibility inspired by the film Raiders of the Lost Ark. What about the alien bodies found in Roswell? Where are they? With all of these crashes, it's hard to believe that the army would have been able to recover every single remnant of proof. It's also hard to believe that over the years, no military officer has ever attempted to photograph or film one of these shipwrecked UFOs.
Executions, murders, rapes, nuclear testing and genetic experiments have all been filmed in secret. But no UFO crashes have ever been filmed. There's a saying that a lack of proof doesn't mean that something doesn't exist. After all these years, the proof that UFO crashes happened is so insubstantial that this saying seems to be more of a consolation for believers rather than the truth.